Dr. Kenyon, what first interested you in origin of life research? Well, I've had a long-standing interest in uh, the life sciences and and uh, goes back to high school days. Um, when I got to college as, a, as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, I was studying physics at the time, but the Darwin uh, Centennial Celebration uh, took place there in 1959, and uh, I had an opportunity to hear some, uh, some great people uh, speak on the subject of origins, and really piqued my interest and kind of had an uh, impact on me for deciding what to do in, in graduate school, going on to Stanford and working with some people who were working on the origin of life problems. Um, what was your viewpoint on the origin of life when you wrote Biochemical Predestination? Well, at that time I was working as a postdoctoral fellow in Melvin uh, Calvin's laboratory at UC Berkeley uh, in an atmosphere uh, where there was a great deal of work and discussion on the origin of life problem from the perspective of chemical evolution theory. And uh, I uh, had that view that, uh, that life did in fact arise on the planet by, uh, by a chemical evolutionary process. I was uh, pretty convinced that, that that in fact was the case. How have your views on the origin of life changed since you wrote Biochemical Predestination? Well, uh, in the years following uh, publication of uh, Biochemical Predestination, uh, I had the opportunity to teach uh, in the area of uh, origin of life uh, and in the area of Darwinian evolution uh, here at San Francisco State. And uh, after about 10 years of this uh, teaching activity, I began to have some doubts about uh, whether or not life could have arisen uh, by natural means, by chemical evolution. And I had some doubts, growing doubts, about uh, whether or not there was a, a Darwinian uh, process to generate the major uh, forms of life. Uh, and so uh, it, took, it took a while to, to reorient uh, my thinking, but I did uh, eventually uh, uh, change my views uh, in both those areas. Yeah. Do many of your colleagues support your new position? If not, why not? Actually, very few have been uh, supportive um, of my uh, views, new views on, on origin of life and uh, the, the development of the, of the species. Um, I think a rather larger number of my faculty colleagues, however, are, are willing to uh, allow me to express these uh, new views in, in class. Uh, but the majority, though, uh, are unhappy on uh, both counts, I would say. Um, and uh, as to why uh, they hold this view, uh, I don't think there's a simple uh, answer to this. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, possibilities are that, um, that the Darwinian uh, way of thinking is such a deeply ingrained uh, habit of thought. Um, it's been uh, prevalent for such a long time and it has so many um, implications for, for the whole of the biological sciences. Um, Another uh, aspect uh, tied to that, of course, is how graduate students are socialized as they go through their program and hear only uh, the Darwinian story of origins. And, uh, and I think my colleagues uh, in general, uh, those who are opposed to this, uh, uh, are very reluctant to, um, to, uh, to take time to examine this issue and maybe they realize the, the large orient reorientation of thought that would be re required if they were to change their views. So. What are the general presuppositions that scientists make who study the origin of life? Well, I think there are two um, general, most general kinds of presuppositions that people can make. Uh, one is that uh, life, in fact, did arise naturalistically on the primitive Earth by some kind of chemical evolutionary process. Uh, the second presupposition would be um, that life may or may not have arisen by a naturalistic chemical evolutionary process. Now, if you have the first presupposition, uh, then the goal of your research is to work out 
plausible pathways of uh, chemical uh, development uh, to go to the biopolymers and to the protocells and what, what would be likely pathways that you could demonstrate in, in the laboratory by simulation experiments. If you have the second presupposition, um, you're still going to be doing experiments, but you're going to be more open, I think, to the possibility that the data as they come in from those studies may actually be suggesting a different uh, explanation of origins altogether. What is the Oparin-Haldane hypothesis, and what role does it play in current research and teaching on the origin of life? Well, the Oparin-Haldane um, hypothesis is uh, the uh, most general theoretical framework uh, for, uh, within which uh, experiments uh, and, and research on the origin of life uh, are conducted still today. Uh, Oparin proposed his chemical evolutionary views uh, for the first time back in the 1920s and Haldane uh, uh, right at the end of the decade of the 20s. And essentially the hypothesis says that uh, on the primitive earth before any life was present, uh, you had um, carbon compounds in very simple form in the atmosphere uh, in the form of methane, uh, um, for example, and other simple gaseous substances, and that these um, would gradually increase in complexity under the influence of energy um, provided in the natural environment, solar ultraviolet flux, for example, cosmic radiation, heat energy. And um, then you would get um, uh, the transfer of these uh, molecules, uh, more, somewhat more complicated molecules, down into the oceans, uh, amino acids and sugars, for example, and then these would link up later on uh, uh, into polymers, uh, polysaccharides, proteins, and then you could have nucleic acids forming. Then you get protocells from aggregation of these materials. They would compete by a kind of proto-natural um, selection process, a proto-Darwinian process, and the one that would win that competition uh, for, for dwindling nutrition in the oceans uh, would be the first to arrive at the state of a full uh, living cell. So it was a process of very gradual uh, um, uh, complexification of carbon compounds um, taking uh, maybe hundreds of millions of years. What are the major underlying assumptions of the Oparin hypothesis of chemical evolution? Well, there are a number of them. The first uh, that I could think of was that uh, Oparin thought that the, the ancient atmosphere was very different from our present uh, air. It was a reduced atmosphere, and it did not have molecular oxygen in it at all. Uh, typical gases were methane, ammonia, water vapor, and molecular hydrogen. Um, Another assumption uh, would be that the uh, molecules that were formed in the uh, atmosphere under the influence of these energy sources um, were uh, somehow protected from destruction by those same energy sources so that you could really have an accumulation of, of uh, life-building substances, amino acids and sugars and purines and pyrimidines could actually survive the rigors of the ancient uh, uh, environment. Once they got into the ocean, if they ever did, um, another assumption of the hypothesis would be that um, just the right, uh, what we call biomonomers, amino acids, for example, uh, or sugars, uh, would react with the same kind of biomonomer to give you the kind of polymer that is so characteristic of of life, uh, namely uh, a polypeptide, all amino acids. In other words, no other substance would get in there and interfere with that um, clean production of polypeptides. What are the major underlying assumptions of the Oparin hypothesis of chemical evolution? Well, there are a number of them. The first uh, that I could think of was that uh, Oparin thought that the, the ancient atmosphere was very different from our present uh, air. It was a reduced atmosphere, and it did not have molecular oxygen in it at all. Uh, typical gases were methane, ammonia, water vapor, and molecular hydrogen. Um, Another assumption uh, would be that the uh, molecules that were formed in the uh, atmosphere under the influence of these energy sources um, were uh, somehow protected from destruction by those same energy sources so that you could really have an accumulation of, of uh, life-building substances, amino acids and sugars and purines and pyrimidines could actually survive the rigors of the ancient uh, uh, environment. 
once they got into the ocean, if they ever did, um, another assumption of the hypothesis would be that um, just the right, uh, what we call biomonomers, amino acids, for example, uh, or sugars, uh, would react with the same kind of biomonomer to give you the kind of polymer that is so characteristic of of life, uh, namely uh, a polypeptide, all amino acids. In other words, no other substance would get in there and interfere with that um, clean production of polypeptides. How well are these assumptions supported by currently available scientific data? Well, let's start with the assumption of the reduced or reducing uh, atmosphere of the uh, uh, primitive Earth. Um, I think that um, if we look at current geological data referring to um, the, min the oxygen content of ancient uh, surface minerals, uh, we cannot decide the issue of whether the ancient atmosphere was reduced or not. But the evidence is consistent with the possibility that there may have been some oxygen present in the uh, old atmosphere. Uh, another reason for um, uh, believing in the strong possibility of uh, molecular oxygen having been present from the earliest times in the atmosphere is the fact that even today in the high atmosphere, water vapor is being uh, photo dissociated by the solar ultraviolet radiation and the result is molecular oxygen and molecular hydrogen. Hydrogen is very light, could have escaped into inter planetary space, leaving that oxygen there, uh, I think, from the very earliest times. So if oxygen had been present, uh, even to the extent of only 1% its level, or a tenth of a percent of its level in the current atmosphere, I don't think you could have had any chemical evolutionary development at all, because oxygen destroys organic uh, compounds um, very effectively. So you could say that chemical evolution, uh, according to the Oparin hypothesis, would have been extinguished right at its source, right at the earliest uh, stages of its uh, movement. What is your evaluation of the Miller type of simulation experiment? Well, I think uh, Stanley Miller's uh, pioneering simulation studies, uh, at the time they were done, uh, did provide uh, some very valuable uh, insights into the possibility that a chemical evolutionary development might have might have occurred on the primitive Earth. He um, did discover in his apparatus the formation, the synthesis of several protein-forming amino acids and a few other substances of the type that occur uh, in cells. Um, I think in, in subsequent years, though, as time has gone on, we've looked at these experiments um, in the light of uh, new uh, uh, scientific data, um, that they ap appear to be less and less relevant to the, uh, to the question of origin of first life. Um, there is the issue of the, um, uh, the composition of the atmosphere and uh, the crucial question of molecular oxygen, um, which is routinely excluded from, um, from all of the Miller experiments, um, uh, his original ones and all of the, the uh, follow-up studies that have been done uh, since that time by others. And if oxygen is present in the apparatus, uh, you're not going to see any synthesis of amino acids. You better also not include molecular hydrogen as Miller did in the uh, first study because then you'd have a, a great explosion in the laboratory. So, so I think that we, we do have um, reason now for, for doubting that these uh, studies uh, uh, tell us much about the possible origin of life. Uh, I think most of the chemical reactions that go on in this um, apparatus are away from life. Um, the substance that appears in the apparatus is a kind of, uh, that coats the whole inside of the apparatus, kind of a, this amber intractable um, macromolecular 
particular uh, material that is non-biological, not, doesn't occur in any organism, but represents 85% or so of the converted carbon uh, that you start with as methane. So the trend in these uh, experiments is really not toward biochemistry, but in my view, is away from biochemistry. Is it possible that interfering cross-reactions might prevent life from arising naturalistically? I think that's very likely. Um, the most prominent interfering cross-reaction I can think of at the moment is the, the so-called Mallard reaction. Now this is a reaction that, w that happens between sugars on the one hand, or aldehydes, and then on the other hand, amino acids or amines. And uh, these are two classes of substance that uh, would be very important in any um, chemical evolutionary development toward life. And their tendency is powerfully to react with one another uh, rather than for the amino acids to be able to react with themselves on the way to protein or sugars to react with themselves on the way to polysaccharide. The cross-reaction to form um, an insoluble polymeric material called melanoidin is far and away the more probable reaction, and this is uh, very well documented in the literature, this reaction, the Mallard reaction, has been known for, for many years, and um, in fact is the reaction that, in, that is involved uh, in the browning of, uh, of foods, when, when you cook uh, and do baking and so on, and also the uh, brown color in, uh, in various beverages is, is, is a result of the cross-reaction of amino acids and, and sugars. Um, I believe that kind of thing happens in the Miller um, simulation studies, but what it does is it takes you away from the development toward the first, uh, toward living matter, and uh, kind of uh, locks up the um, organic matter in this uh, inert um, uh, form. Stanley Miller's pioneering work in the origin of life assumed a reducing atmosphere of methane, ammonia, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. Is there sufficient empirical support for this assumption? I think there's not sufficient empirical support for this assumption. Uh, I think, if anything, the balance of evidence suggests that it, it is wrong, that, uh, that it, it seems more likely to me from the geological evidence that we have about uh, very ancient uh, sedimentary rocks and their oxygen content and about the photo dissociation of water vapor in the upper atmosphere that the early atmosphere would be far more oxidized uh, than uh, the early uh, Miller experiments uh, assumed um, but, and, but even more oxidized than the current uh, Miller experiments. Um, he, he's using uh, carbon dioxide instead of methane now, and he's using carbon monoxide and molecular nitrogen instead of ammonia now. But I think that the, uh, the crucial question is still the absence of molecular oxygen. They're still routinely keeping that uh, material out. And, I, and the, uh, the reason seems to be not an empirical reason, but a methodological um, necessity, if we could put it that way. In other words, um, if molecular, the argument, as I understand it, goes something like this. If molecular oxygen had been present, then chemical evolution could not have happened. Therefore, molecular oxygen must have been absent because we know that chemical evolution happened. But I think it's important to note that we do not have uh, independent or convincing independent corroboration of that absence of oxygen. Do Sidney Fox's proteinoid microsystems represent a plausible laboratory model of the protocell stage of chemical evolution? Well, Sidney Fox's uh, proteinoid microsystems are an indeed very interesting experimental model. Um, I th I'm impressed by the fact that you can go in one continuous uh, sequence from um, amino acids uh, all the way to microscopic units of bacterial dimension. Uh, when you look at these microsystems under the microscope, they indeed resemble the light microscope level uh, spherical bacteria in size. Um, but I think the resemblance stops there. Uh, I believe that if you, uh, I know that if you look at this uh, into the chemical composition of these microsystems, you find very little that reminds you of the chemical complexity of cells. There is generally no uh, protein present. Proteinoid is present, but that is not the same as genuine protein.
protein. It does have amino acids in it, but uh, it, there are many chemical differences between the proteinoids and protein. There are no nucleic acids in these uh, systems, no polysaccharides, no lipids. There is no metabolism going on. They're chemically inert. There's no genetic information whatsoever, uh, in my view, in these microsystems. Um, they are not self-replicating units. They have no energy capture or processing capability. So when you run down that list of, uh, of um, negative features, you come away pretty much with the view that um, these proteinoid microsystems probably uh, didn't have anything to do uh, with, a, with the origin of life. How large a gap is there between the most complex protocell model and the simplest living cell? Well, I think this gap is an enormous gap. Um, uh, you have um, the, the great difference between the most complicated protocell and the simplest living cell, which would be something like a mycoplasma type of organism. Um, you just don't have any of the ultrastructural detail in the protocell models. You don't have any ribosomes, you don't have any nucleoprotein particles of any kind, uh, you don't have any nucleic acid in there. Um, uh, you, you just have uh, a simple little microscopic inclusion in these protocells uh, with virtually no lifelike uh, properties. So I see the gap between the best protocells that have been produced in the laboratory and the simplest uh, authentic living cells we have today to be an immense uh, gap. What is the biologically relevant information content of the simplest living organism known to exist? The uh, information content of the simplest cell that we uh, have today, I would estimate to be about one million bits. Um, and um, this would be typical of uh, some of the mycoplasma type of organisms. Um, you, I'm, I'm assuming that about uh, for every uh, base pair in the uh, DNA of the genome of this simple cell, you have uh, approximately two bits of information. Um, now, as to the estimate of what the minimal cell historically would have had to have possessed in order to be uh, considered to be a, an actual living uh, entity, um, I would put the figure down um, to no less than 10 to the fifth or 100,000 bits. And I, I'd be willing to, to believe that you could put together a minimal cell with about a, a tenth as much genetic information in it as, as in the simplest uh, cell today. Uh, I assume about 500 uh, uh, enzymes required for the minimal cell, about 100 amino acids for each of those enzymes, and then you just, uh, a simple calculation gives you about 10 to the fifth uh, uh, bits of information, assuming no redundant uh, DNA in the simplest organisms, and that's what we see today anyway, the simplest organisms to use all of their DNA for genetic uh, information. What is the biologically relevant information content of the simplest living organism known to exist? The uh, information content of the simplest cell that we uh, have today, I would estimate to be about one million bits. Um, and um, this would be typical of uh, some of the mycoplasma type of organisms. Um, you, I'm, I'm assuming that about uh, for every uh, base pair in the uh, DNA of the genome of this simple cell, you have uh, approximately two bits of information. Um, now, as to the estimate of what the minimal cell historically would have had to have possessed in order to be uh, considered to be a, an actual living uh, entity, um, I would put the figure down um, to no less than 10 to the fifth or 100,000 bits. And I'd be willing to, to believe that you could put together a minimal cell with about a, a tenth as much genetic information in it as, as in the simplest uh, cell today. Uh, I assume about 500 uh, uh, enzymes required for the minimal cell, about 100 amino acids for each of those enzymes, and then you just, a simple calculation gives you about 10 to the fifth uh, uh, bits of information, assuming no redundant uh, DNA in the simplest organisms. And that's what we see today anyway, the simplest organisms to use all of their DNA for genetic uh, information. How probable is it that such complexity could arise by undirected chemical processes? 
Well, I think uh, random chemical processes um, uh, would have virtually no uh, chance of generating the kind, the specific order that you need in the uh, in the earliest cell in the biopolymers in the proteins and in the nucleic acids. Uh, you just have to have a specific sequence of uh, of subunits, and um, I think you can show by some pretty. Um, convincing probability calculations such as have been carried out by Hubert uh, Yaki uh, that it, it, in the whole history of the, of the of planet Earth in four and a half billion years uh, you would really not expect to find um, in the primitive oceans uh, more than uh, one or two or half a dozen uh, at most uh, functioning um, enzymes and, and uh, this is not even taking into account the issue of having the minimum set of enzymes for metabolism, the 500, let's say, uh, all at the same place at the same time. This is just a calculation that trying to, to see what the likelihood is of, of finding just one molecule of one functioning protein or a half dozen at most. And uh, so I think that, uh, in my view, there's virtually no chance of um, chemical processes um, uh, generating the kind of specified complexity that we need in the, for the first living organism. What is the most plausible scenario for a purely naturalistic origin of life? I don't think there is one. Um, I uh, have reviewed uh, many suggestions and um, I can't uh, say that I uh, could really uh, support or, or give credence to, en to any of those that have been, uh, have been proposed. I, I think Miller's uh, experiments uh, do, do show us the possibility of getting some of the biomonomers we need. And, 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 and that's to the good. I mean, that's a, a strong point of that uh, methodology, Miller's simulation type of studies. But uh, I don't um, have a candidate for the most plausible um, general scheme for going all the way to the to the first cells. What are the major unsolved problems in origin of life research? Well, I think one of the unsolved problems has to do with the optical isomer preference. Uh, how can we get L amino acids in, uh, when, uh, going into the first uh, biopolymers when the experiments routinely show an absolutely equal production of the L form and the D form. Uh, the same situation exists with respect to the sugars in the DNA and so I think that uh, that is uh, a, a most difficult and intractable problem. It has not yielded at all in the, in the four decades that it's been uh, studied. We know no more today about it than we did 40 years ago on that. Um, other unsolved problems involve uh, how you could have um, the formation of the um, uh, first nucleic acid molecules. Uh, we don't have a chemical pathway that, that's convincing to get either RNA or DNA um, formed on the, on the primitive earth. Um, and then on top of that, we have not the slightest um, in, uh, experimental indication of how the, the, um, these polymers, if they could have formed, could have acquired um, genetic information, this crucial problem of how you link the subunits together in just the order that they must be in order to code for uh, proteins that can participate in metabolism. Not just any specific order in DNA will be biologically relevant uh, order. It's got to be those uh, sequences that have biologic uh, meaning. So I would say that um, those are the two um, most difficult uh, outstanding problems, origin of genetic information and origin of optical uh, isomer preferences. What is the relevance of the second law of thermodynamics to the origin of life? Well, I think that the second law of thermodynamics does have some relevancy to the origin of life problem, but I, I do think that you have to be very careful in, des in describing uh, just the, the way in which it, it, it is relevant to the, to the origin of life. The second law says that an isolated physical system, one that's not exchanging matter or energy with its outside surroundings, will, in every change that it undergoes, tend to go to a state of greater disorder or, or greater entropy, and, um, and at the same time the free energy or usable energy is declining. Um, 
The chemical evolution hypothesis about origin of life on the surface of the primitive Earth, when you first look at it, seems to be sharply against the second law of thermodynamics, uh, going from a, a relatively chaotic state of the primitive gases in the primitive atmosphere to these highly organized uh, and complex uh, molecular systems that are living cells. But you, you, have, you can point out, though, that the surface of the Earth is an open system, and it is receiving uh, high-grade uh, energy uh, from, the, uh, from the sun. So you could maintain that uh, just so long as the um, uh, decrease in entropy on the surface of the Earth is compensated for by, a, by an equal or greater um, increase in entropy uh, in, the, in the total system, Earth plus sun, that it is conceivable that chemical evolution does not violate the second uh, law of thermodynamics. The problem I have with that is that we have no empirical indication whatsoever as to how an energy capture system, i.e. a primitive photosynthesis uh, uh, mechanism, could have originated uh, by purely uh, natural means. And then, of course, we have no um, indication uh, in the experimental data as to how a genetic system, uh, a, a gene, uh, which would direct uh, chemistry against the, the tendency that the second law uh, imposes on matter toward greater disorder. In the absence of those two lines of evidence, I'm going to suspend judgment about whether or not the, uh, the origin of life uh, violates the second law. But I think that, that just on the face of it, uh, there is this uh, huge problem. You know, the second law go uh, describes matter going to decreasing states of complexity, and the presumed origin of life by natural means is, a, is a, the reverse process. Is it plausible that an RNA world was the precursor of the first living cells? Well, the RNA world concept does have a number of uh, attractive features. Um, uh, with the discovery that RNA has both catalytic activity and genetic information-bearing ability, uh, you have a single molecule type that combines the, the, um, prop the key properties of the two great classes of uh, macromolecule in life, the uh, nucleic acids on the one hand and the proteins on the other hand. So many uh, researchers have uh, believed that uh, the first um, uh, living systems might have developed out of a, s a situation where you just had the RNA a polymers in the primitive oceans uh, undergoing some kind of uh, proto-natural selection toward the first uh, uh, cells. Um, I think there are a number of problems with the RNA world hypothesis. One is, how do you get the RNA polymers in the first place? I don't see how. It's, it's uh, given what we know about the chemical properties of the building blocks of the RNA, how they could survive uh, in the energy um, rigors of the primitive um, uh, surface. They would have been destroyed by ultraviolet uh, radiation. Uh, but more importantly, how do you get these building blocks of RNA to link up in the natural manner to form um, the biological polymer in the face of potentially uh, interfering cross-reactions, which would have been much more likely in the primitive um, uh, oceans. Uh, so I have problems with how you get the raw materials, the starting point for the RNA world. The second problem I have with the RNA world is that the catalytic activities that have been discovered for RNA are really highly specialized, few in number, and they have to do with complex events in the, in the eukaryotic cell, processing uh, that RNA in a highly evolved uh, system. And I'm not sure that that kind of uh, catalytic activity would have been uh, relevant in a, in a, in a prebiotic uh, setting, where you need a vast range of, um, of different catalytic activities, sort of a generalized catalysis over the whole metabolic uh, spectrum. Um, so I uh, do not think the RNA world uh, helps us, concept helps us much in the origin of life uh, problem. What is the relevance of the second law of thermodynamics to the origin of life? Well, I think that the second law of thermodynamics does have some relevancy to the origin of life problem, but I, I do think that you have to be very careful in, des in describing 
uh, just the, the way in which it, it, it is relevant to the, to the origin of life. The second law says that an isolated physical system, one that's not exchanging matter or energy with its outside surroundings, will, in every change that it undergoes, tend to go to a state of greater disorder or, or greater entropy and, um, and at the same time the free energy or usable energy is declining. Um, the chemical evolution hypothesis about origin of life on the surface of the primitive earth when you first look at it seems to be sharply against the second law of thermodynamics, uh, going from a, a relatively chaotic state of the primitive gases in the primitive atmosphere to these highly organized uh, uh, and complex uh, molecular systems that are living cells. But you, you, have, you can point out, though, that the surface of the Earth is an open system, and it is receiving uh, high-grade uh, energy uh, from, the, uh, from the sun. So you could maintain that uh, just so long as the um, uh, decrease in entropy on the surface of the Earth is compensated for by, a, by an equal or greater um, increase in entropy uh, in, the, in the total system, Earth plus sun, that it is conceivable that chemical evolution does not violate the second uh, law of thermodynamics. The problem I have with that is that we have no empirical indication whatsoever as to how an energy capture system, i.e. a primitive photosynthesis uh, uh, mechanism, could have originated uh, by purely uh, natural means. And then, of course, we have no um, indication uh, in the experimental data as to how a genetic system, uh, a, a gene, uh, which would direct uh, chemistry against the, the tendency that the second law uh, imposes on matter toward greater disorder. In the absence of those two lines of evidence, I'm going to suspend judgment about whether or not the uh, the origin of life uh, violates the second law, but I think that, that just on the face of it, uh, there is this uh, huge problem. You know, the second law go uh, describes matter going to decreasing states of complexity, and the presumed origin of life by natural means is, a, is a, the reverse process. Is it plausible that an RNA world was the precursor of the first living cells? Well, the RNA world concept does have a number of uh, attractive features. Um, uh, with the discovery that RNA has both catalytic activity and genetic information bearing ability, uh, you have a single molecule type that combines the, the, um, prop the key properties of the two great classes of uh, macromolecule in life, the uh, nucleic acids on the one hand and the proteins on the other hand. So many uh, researchers have uh, believed that uh, the first um, uh, living systems might have developed out of a, a situation where you just had the RNA polymers in the primitive oceans uh, undergoing some kind of uh, uh, proto-natural selection toward the first uh, uh, cells. Um, I think there are a number of problems with the RNA world hypothesis. One is, how do you get the RNA polymers in the first place? I don't see how, it's, it's, uh, given what we know about the chemical properties of the building blocks of the RNA, how they could survive uh, in the energy um, rigors of the primitive um, uh, surface. They would have been destroyed by ultraviolet uh, radiation. Uh, but more importantly, how do you get these building blocks of RNA to link up in the natural manner to form um, the biological polymer in the face of potentially uh, interfering cross-reactions, which would have been much more likely in the primitive um, uh, oceans. Uh, so I have problems with how you get the raw materials, the starting point for the RNA world. The second problem I have with the RNA world is that the catalytic activities that have been discovered for RNA are really highly specialized, few in number, and they have to do with complex events in the, in the eukaryotic cell, processing uh, that RNA in a highly evolved uh, system. And I'm not sure that that kind of uh, catalytic activity would have been uh, relevant in a, in a, in a prebiotic uh, setting where you'd need a vast range of, um, of different catalytic activities, sort of a generalized catalysis over the whole metabolic uh, spectrum. Um, so I uh, do not think the RNA world uh, helps us, concept helps us much in the origin of life uh, problem.
Why must proteins in living organisms contain only left-handed amino acids? Well, I don't have a completely satisfactory answer as to why uh, present organisms uh, uh, need to have or must have just one optical isomer of the amino acids and the, and the sugars in the DNA. I have some ideas about it. One would be that um, in order for enzymes to uh, work and recognize their substrate, you have to have what's called a, uh, a three-point landing on the surface of, um, of an enzyme molecule. And, and so if you had the D form of an amino acid um, interacting or colliding with the surface of um, the active site of, a, of an enzyme, uh, the enzyme would not recognize the amino acid. Uh, if we had uh, both D and L forms of amino acid in our polymers, in our proteins, and uh, same thing for sugars in our nucleic acids, we would need, it seems to me, many, many more enzymes than we can get by with today in living systems because you'd need an enzyme for the D form and then another enzyme for the L form of amino acid if both were used in uh, in biological uh, processes. So it would seem to be very uh, inefficient energetically. The cell would have to invest so much energy building all of these uh, extra uh, enzymes. Um, so there is something to be said for the efficiency that you get when you just go down to one um, optical isomer. Uh, as to how this could have originated, I, uh, we, we, we haven't the, the slightest idea. We, we, don't, we don't find any asymmetric forces in nature which could have given us the isomer preferences before life uh, started. Why must proteins in living organisms contain only left-handed amino acids? Well, I don't have a completely satisfactory answer as to why uh, present organisms uh, uh, need to have or must have just one optical isomer of the amino acids and the, and the sugars in the DNA. I have some ideas about it. One would be that um, in order for enzymes to uh, work and recognize their substrate, you have to have what's called a, uh, a three-point landing on the surface of, a, of an enzyme molecule. And, and so if you had the D form of an amino acid um, interacting or colliding with the surface of um, the active site of, a, of an enzyme, uh, the enzyme would not recognize the amino acid. Uh, if we had uh, both D and L forms of amino acid in our polymers, in our proteins, and uh, same thing for sugars in our nucleic acids, we would need, it seems to me, many, many more enzymes than we can get by with today in living systems because you'd need an enzyme for the D form and then another enzyme for the L form of amino acid if both were used in uh, in biological uh, processes. So it would seem to be very uh, inefficient energetically. The cell would have to invest so much energy building all of these uh, extra uh, enzymes. Um, so there is something to be said for the efficiency that you get when you just go down to one um, optical isomer. Uh, as to how this could have originated, I, uh, we, we, we haven't the, the slightest idea. We, we, don't, we don't find any asymmetric forces in nature which could have given us the isomer preferences before life uh, started. Why must nucleic acids contain D rather than L sugars? How is the problem of chemical chirality accounted for in naturalistic origin of life theories? Well, I think that uh, uh, we have uh, the need in current biochemistry for one of the two uh, stereoisomers, the L uh, versus uh, the D, uh, for um, the efficiency of enzyme action and also the, to avoid having the need to have so many extra enzymes to, to, uh, to react with the, with the other isomer if both are present. So there's an energy uh, savings there. Um, but we, from a point of view of, of the naturalistic uh, theories of origin of life, we, we haven't an explanation at all for how this um, current preference of optical isomers uh, uh, developed. Many experiments have been tried searching for clues as to how you might have gotten a preference of one over the other. 
And uh, William Bonner at Stanford University, um, chemistry professor there who has researched this problem for about three uh, decades, wrote a review in 1991 of this subject, concluded it by saying we don't know any more now than we did when the search first began. They're just, it, it's just a very great uh, enigma, a, a tremendous problem. If life did not originate by chemical evolution on the primitive Earth, what other possible scientific explanations exist? A number of uh, suggestions have been made about uh, other possible um, uh, origin scenarios. Um, they tend to go toward extraterrestrial origin, though. Um, uh, I think more and more uh, scientists are, are recognizing the many, many problems with the um, chemical evolution theory for origin of life on Earth. And uh, some of those are proposing that the origin didn't take place on the Earth at all, but took place somewhere else in the cosmos, and then the first living cells, uh, microscopic uh, microorganisms, were, were transported somehow to, uh, to Earth. Um, we have the directed panspermia idea. Uh, I'm not totally convinced this was proposed uh, totally seriously, but uh, it's, it's, it's in the literature and it's the idea that life originated uh, on some other place in the cosmos and then an intelligent life form shipped the first microbes to our planet deliberately, directed panspermia. So there's one possibility. Um, Professor Bonner has suggested that uh, the optical isomer sorting uh, could, uh, must have taken place in an extraterrestrial setting. He does not see how it would have been possible on the Earth, but it's, we have the result of the sorting today. Chemical evolution must have happened somewhere, so it must have happened by an unknown means um, in deep space, and then the, um, the isomers transported uh, uh, down to the Earth. What do you mean by your statement that Perhaps scientism is more widespread than we like to think. Well, I think um, that uh, in view of the, so, of the great many difficulties that uh, we're now aware of in the, in the theorizing uh, about origin of life and along the lines of chemical evolution, uh, it is a rather uh, surprising fact uh, that so many scientists still uh, insist that a chemical evolutionary origin uh, will be found with, with future research. In my mind, it must go back to the general presuppositions that people make uh, in regarding this area. And uh, the first presupposition is that chemical evolution must have happened, and we're going to keep searching until we find some kind of plausible uh, actual chemical sequence. But uh, that looks less and less likely now, and yet we still have um, a general agreement that it must have happened, and it's still uniformly taught that way in uh, uni university uh, science classes. And so maybe it has something to do with scientism, this, the, which I take to mean the, the belief that, that um, uh, scientific method, um, as presently defined and conceived, can answer every question, including the great question of, uh, of origins, origin of the universe, origin of life. And uh, so that's what I mean by scientism uh, being perhaps very deeply ingrained in our, in our scientific culture, in our, in our academic culture. Is it possible that natural processes are insufficient to account for the origin of all biological information? Not only possible, I think highly likely that uh, natural uh, means are, are insufficient to account uh, for anything but the really the almost trivial in, increase in, in biologic information. Can science rule out the possibility that most biological information had an intelligent cause? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, quite the contrary, that uh, it, is, it, it makes sense to uh, actually uh, reach the conclusion that uh, from, from the data of, of origin of life studies, from the data of molecular biology, and from many fields in the life uh, of science, um, that uh, an intelligent uh, origin is a very likely possibility for the um, origin of the, uh, of the first life. What do you mean by intelligent design as it relates to the origin of life? Well, intelligent design, um, I think we reason here by, by analogy. And um, 
I like to think of it uh, along these lines that uh, if one attempts to classify physical systems, um, complex and ordered physical systems, uh, as to how they come into existence um, in the first instance and in subsequent instances of them, uh, I think that you can find that the, the physical systems sort out into three categories. The first type of system, um, which I regard as the low information uh, type of a system, would be a, uh, um, an object uh, in nature that could arise by purely natural means, you know, rock formations, uh, snowflakes, uh, crystals of all kinds, uh, storm patterns, um, uh, many different uh, examples exist, but these systems I call type one systems and they, they can or, uh, originate spontaneously by purely natural processes. Type two systems have to do with systems that uh, humans are familiar with as manufactured uh, artifacts, um, everything from a, from a paper clip to a supercomputer. Um, there, the matter is arranged in such a way that we cannot see how it could have gotten that way spontaneously because we can't uh, deduce the order from the physics and chemistry of the, uh, of the components. Um, uh, writing and language is also in this uh, category. The pattern of letters in intelligible text does not uh, come from the physics and chemistry of ink and paper, but it has to be impressed on the matter from the outside. So these I call type two systems. Um, the first origin of, of an instance there is um, um, by manufacture, and the subsequent instances are also all by manufacture because these are not pro self-propagating systems. There's a moderately high information content to these. Um, I mean, the range goes up into pretty high numbers of information content. Now, the question is, what is a living cell? What uh, does, does it fit into type one or type two um, order? I think it's a third category. Um, the first instance, I think, has to have, uh, of the first cells ha has to be uh, by uh, creation, of, uh, by an intelligence. Um, but then once it, it appears, it is self-propagating. So it can, all subsequent instances um, come from the first one by purely natural uh, processes. Um, I think that in this third class, there, there may be one other uh, instance. That's the von Neumann machine, the, the, the uh, artificial device not yet uh, manufactured, but a theoretical device which could be self-replicating. A manufactured device that could do its own mining operations, its own smelting operations, its own preparation of material, and then fabrication of itself, and then it could be a truly self-propagating artificial system. So I think that third class has two members, living cells and uh, the von Neumann machine, possibly. Uh, Okay, this gives us a framework in which to, to answer the question about what we mean about intelligent design and the origin of life. It seems to me that the order we find in cells, especially in the DNA um, and the genetic information, is more like type 2 order than type 1 order. Um, and therefore, I would say the indications are very powerful that the first living cell must have been, um, well, for want of a better term, in, in quotes, manufactured somehow. Why is an intelligent design or creationist interpretation of the scientific data not acceptable to many scientists? Well, I think the reasons here, uh, there'd, be ma there'd be many reasons. Um, we would go back to um, the climate of opinion uh, at the time that Darwin's uh, work was, was done. And uh, remember, the, the battle there was between special creationists and, um, and those who wanted to have a, a completely what they conceived of as a completely naturalistic uh, explanation for this large area of, uh, of science, namely the, the origin and development uh, of life. And um, so uh, Darwin's ideas were, uh, were very appealing, I think, to many scientists who also wanted uh, to further this program themselves but couldn't see a way of doing it. And he came up with a, um, a naturalistic, a uniformitarian explanation that in, uh, given the information available in his day seemed very convincing and his method of argument was, was outstanding. Is a rhetorical genius, uh, no, no question about it. Okay, so then you had um, a long period of time um, in which the faculties of the, of the universities were, uh, were Darwinist. Uh, and uh, so deeply ingrained habits of thought in, in the succeeding uh, decades. And so that now uh, you find that um, 
that most of the, the professors, people working, research scientists, uh, are have been so deeply committed to these habits of thought that any suggestion that the naturalistic explanation may not be sufficient is, is to them like going back to the old uh, special creation uh, uh, f uh, mindset that um, they thought they were got, got, got gotten away from uh, for good uh, with it finally accepting uh, Darwin's uh, view. What criteria could be used to determine if the information content of living organisms had an intelligent or natural cause? Uh, this is a current uh, need in, in, in the research uh, effort to try and define formal criteria, uh, quantifiable if possible, um, that will allow one to decide whether a given type of order that's seen, or complexity we should say, seen in nature, uh, is likely to have had an intelligent cause or uh, is uh, rather, on the other hand, uh, explainable by, by purely uh, natural means. I think this concept of specified complexity is important, that um, you have to have particular order of subunits that have um, biological uh, a meaning, and um, if you find a system that has an order like that uh, in it, uh, then it's got, it's likely in my mind that it came from an intelligent source. Again, a reasoning by analogy to, uh, to manufactured, uh, the kind of order we find in manufactured uh, uh, items. Probably also the, we would bring in the probability would be quite low. Um, a probability calculation for the chances of getting the same type of order by uh, chemical means would have to be a, a, a very tiny number. Now exactly how small it would have to be, I mean that's something that has to be uh, worked on. But um, we're at the be beginning of that, uh, of that phase of things now. Does academic freedom allow you to discuss the difficulties of scientific naturalism and origin of life theories? Well, well I think uh, ideally academic freedom uh, concepts should allow one to uh, freely examine the criticism of Darwinian evolution and the criticisms of uh, chemical evolution in the classroom uh, and even to uh, discuss the uh, uh, possible alternative interpretations of the data that lead one to, uh, to an intelligent design uh, paradigm. Uh, unfortunately, um, I am uh, not allowed to discuss these topics in my uh, courses here at San Francisco State. Um, it is not felt to be uh, part, a legitimate part of, a, of a, a course outline or a course content to, uh, to give um, uh, counter arguments uh, against uh, the general Darwinian view and certainly not uh, uh, thought to be permissible to um, to give any kind of um, serious discussion of alternative uh, interpretation. Now this raises a very interesting question and that is the question as to why this particular area of science uh, should have this kind of immunity to uh, critical examination. I would have thought that um, that we would have free um, inquiry in this area as we do in virtually every other area of university uh, life and, uh, and for both big issues and small issues um, we should have that same kind of give and take in the, in the great d debate on origins because after all the history of science is full of uh, confrontation of major uh, contending points of view. Just a couple of outstanding examples come to mind. Ptolemaic astronomy and Copernican astronomy, a tremendous debate about the time of the switchover. Galenic physiology and Harveyan physiology, a tremendous debate in the in the early uh, 17th century uh, when, when that was... And you can name many examples, those are quite large examples, there are others on hundreds of examples on smaller scales of the um, comparison that uh, should go on all the time between major contending views but somehow or other in our current um, academic situation regarding the topic of origins and evolution uh, a wall has been built around the uh, subject of neo-darwinism and so one is not really free to um, to to carry on a scientific critique uh, of this uh, topic 
How should the origin of life be taught in light of the California Science Framework Policy, which states that nothing in science or in any other field of knowledge shall be taught dogmatically? Well, not dogmatically, obviously. Now, now, the way it's taught now is very dogmatic in the sense that only one particular view out of several major contending views about origins is permitted uh, in, uh, generally speaking, in uh, university classrooms and uh, also in secondary uh, education level uh, classrooms. And um, if we were to follow the letter of the California guidelines now, then the debate would open up and uh, we, would, we would have this wonderful exchange of views and we would have a chance to, to, to make more rapid progress in our uh, uh, in debate on this and students would be better served. I think students need to know, not about every discussion and dispute that goes on in the scientific world, you can't expect them to be able to, to absorb that, um, uh, but certainly the major fights, uh, they need to have some information about those. How is scientific progress impacted when critiques of current theories are suppressed? Well, I think progress will be much less than it could be ideally. Um, I think that in the climate of uh, free and vigorous uh, debate, uh, you have the greatest chance of making the greatest strides uh, forward. After all, there was a, a very vigorous debate at the time of Darwin's uh, publication of Origin of Species. He won the day, he, wrote, he won it rather quickly, but, he, but there was a, a fight. Um, now we have um, a situation where we have uh, uh, the impression is given that the question of origins is, has long since been settled. And uh, I deny that that's the case. Uh, I think that the more we learn in molecular biology and the more we learn from chemical evolution studies, the less likely is it that the chemical evolution explanation is going to turn out to be the right one. And so it's absolutely imperative now that we open up the discussion uh, and have um, a serious uh, uh, a debate on it. The Veritas Forum will continue its Focus on Origin series with Walter Bradley and Charles Thaxton, co-authors of The Mystery of Life's Origin. Dr. Michael Behe, professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University and author of Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution. And now, a glimpse of things to come. A number of my faculty colleagues, however, are, are willing to uh, allow me to express these uh, new views in, in class. Uh, but the majority, though, uh, are unhappy on uh, both counts, I would say. Um, and uh, as to why uh, they hold this view, uh, I don't think there's a simple uh, answer to this. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, possibilities are that, um, that the Darwinian uh, way of thinking is such a deeply ingrained uh, habit of thought um, it's been uh, prevalent for such a long time and it has so many um, implications for, for the whole of the biological sciences. Um, another uh, aspect uh, tied to that, of course, is how graduate students are socialized as they go through their program and hear only uh, the Darwinian story of origins. And, uh, and I think my colleagues uh, in general, uh, those who are opposed to this, uh, are very reluctant to um, to, uh, to take time to examine this issue and maybe they realize the, the large orient reorientation of thought that would be re required if they were to change their views. So. What are the general presuppositions that scientists make who study the origin of life? Well, I think there are two um, general, most general kinds. Dr. Kenyon, what first interested you in origin of life research? Well, I've had a long-standing interest in uh, the life sciences and and uh, it goes back to high school days. Uh, when I got to college as, a, as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, I was studying physics at the time, but the Darwin uh, Centennial Celebration uh, took place there in 1959, and uh, I had an opportunity to hear some, uh, some great people uh, speak on the subject of origins, and really piqued my interest and kind of had an uh, impact on me for deciding what to do in, in graduate school, going on to Stanford and uh, working with some people who were working on the origin of life problems. Um, what was your viewpoint on the origin of life when you wrote Biochemical Predestination? 
Well, at that time I was working as a postdoctoral fellow in Melvin uh, Calvin's laboratory at UC Berkeley uh, in an atmosphere uh, where there was a great deal of work and discussion on the origin of life problem from the perspective of chemical evolution theory. And uh, I uh, had that view that, uh, that life did in fact arise on the planet by, uh, by a chemical evolutionary process. I was uh, pretty convinced that, that that in fact was the case. How have your views on the origin of life changed since you wrote Biochemical Predestination? Well, uh, in the years following uh, publication of uh, Biochemical Predestination, uh, I had the opportunity to teach uh, in the area of uh, origin of life uh, and in the area of Darwinian evolution uh, here at San Francisco State. And uh, after about 10 years of this uh, teaching activity, I began to have some doubts about uh, whether or not life could have arisen uh, by natural means, by chemical evolution. And I had some doubts, growing doubts, about uh, whether or not there was a, a Darwinian uh, process to generate the major uh, forms of life. Uh, and so uh, it, took, it took a while to, to reorient uh, my thinking, but I did uh, eventually uh, uh, changed my views uh, in both those areas. Yeah. Do many of your colleagues support your new position? If not, why not? Actually, very few have been uh, supportive um, of my uh, views, new views on on origin of life and uh, the, the development of the of the species. Um, I think a rather large kinds of presuppositions that people can make. Uh, one is that uh, life, in fact, did arise naturalistically on the primitive Earth by some kind of chemical evolutionary process. Uh, the second presupposition would be um, that life may or may not have arisen by a naturalistic chemical evolutionary process. Now, if you have the first presupposition, uh, then the goal of your research is to work out plausible pathways of uh, chemical uh, development uh, to go to the biopolymers and to the protocells and what, what would be likely pathways that you could demonstrate in, in the laboratory by simulation experiments. If you have the second presupposition, um, you're still going to be doing experiments, but you're going to be more open, I think, to the possibility that the data as they come in from those studies may actually be suggesting a different uh, explanation of origins altogether. What is the oparin haldane hypothesis, and what role does it play in current research and teaching on the origin of life? Well, the oparin um, haldane hypothesis is uh, the uh, most general theoretical framework uh, for, uh, within which uh, experiments uh, and, and research on the origin of life uh, are conducted still today. Uh, oparin proposed his chemical evolutionary views uh, for the first time back in the 1920s in Haldane, uh, uh, right at the end of the decade of the 20s. And essentially the hypothesis says that uh, on the primitive Earth, before any life was present, uh, you had um, carbon compounds in very simple form in the atmosphere, uh, in the form of methane, um, for example, and other simple gaseous substances, and that these um, would gradually increase in complexity under the influence of energy um, provided in the natural environment, solar ultraviolet flux, for example, cosmic radiation, heat energy. And um, then you would get um, uh, the transfer of these uh, molecules, uh, more, somewhat more complicated molecules, down into the oceans, uh, amino acids and sugars, for example, and then these would link up later on uh, uh, into polymers, uh, polysaccharides, proteins, and then you could have nucleic acids forming, then you get protocells from aggregation of these materials. They would compete by a kind of proto-natural um, selection process, a proto-Darwinian process, and the one that would win that competition uh, for, for dwindling nutrition in the oceans uh, would be the first to arrive at the state of 